Hello, my name is Alexander Moraes and I'm the founder of ITK Media. You've tuned in to the ITK Media podcast about Central and Eastern European uh, startups that are in pre-Series A stage. And today's guest is Sabina Zhowandowska, the co-founder of GeneMe, a company that develops uh, pioneering swab-based genetic test kits for a wide range of uses. And uh, Sabina, hello. Hi, hi, nice to meet you. Yeah, of course, the h- hottest topic for like today and probably this year still will be COVID-related tests. I understand you are covering this area as well. Yeah, it's actually a pretty funny story because uh, Jimmy was founded in 2018. And actually our main goal at that time was to provide genetic testings for all. So the idea was to generate results for patients for lifestyle solutions. So, for example, genetic predispositions for lactose intolerance, dyslexia, and so on. And at the moment when we were about to start our selling, COVID came. (laughs) So, obviously, we had to stop our genetic predisposition diagnostics services, and we moved to COVID uh, because that was the hot topic. But still, uh, one year after pandemia, somewhere in the back uh, of, of us, we are still working very very focusedly on developing solutions for all genetic testing. So in the pipeline, there are at least 40 other tests that we want to develop pretty soon. Yeah. And even if this is kind of a byproduct, you did not make you did not make the like complete pivot into COVID tests. You keep working on other types of tests as well. And as far as your COVID related tests, I understand it's been already used by what Heathrow Airport, Virgin Atlantic and um, Britain's Got Talent how come (laughs) well (laughs) probably because we have a big range of distributors it's around 40 distributors that we have in a pipeline and to be honest i am not aware of all the usage that the the genetic testing that we provide is being utilized with various partners we had also some kind of roll-up for gordon ramsay (laughs) but uh, so far yeah but so far i am not now at the stage to collect this information but it's very nice anywho at the end of the day it's very nice for Jimmy, a polish company based uh, in gdansk that their solutions are being used widely in across european union so nice if in britain got talent as well that's very good i have to disclose this i read from a TechCrunch article and um that's what they say let's 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 trust them yeah, prob- <laughs> Well, probably it is, probably it is because TechCrunch was uh, the article that actually gave us the publicity that we actually wanted after the receiving the big funding that we got from Robin Toms from Yachty. So yeah. if it's there, then for sure it's the way it is. But as I said, we have around 40 distributors in our network and our solutions are being used all over European Union and also outside of European Union. So pretty possible that not only Britain got talent, but also, for example, in Czech airport, our tests are being used and many others. Mm -hmm. Live as a must have or is it an option? Well, from from our perspective, it solely depends on the regulation and solely depends on the distributor how he wants it. And as far as I know, in Czech, it works like that, that the client before flying in or flying back is using the on-premise testing at the airport to get the test faster, because normally you would need to look for a laboratory somewhere inside of the city. And it's just more convenient if you can just test yourself at the airport. Yeah, our regular viewers know that we are now very deep in round one, uh, where we discuss the solution, the product. And while we are here, by the way, do you think uh, we could make a dive uh, into some video or some other kind of uh, presentation of the product? And let's focus on 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 COVID related tests, probably. Okay, ready? So this was one of the first rollouts of Franked products uh, in Poland, and it was done in a holiday resort. Uh, it was actually a very interesting story because the owner of the holiday resort uh, resort found us and said i know you you know that i i know that you provide genetic based uh, testing can you somehow help me to keep my clients safe and basically it worked like that so when the clients were approaching uh, to the resort they were receiving a swabbing kit and they were performing self swabbing as you can see so they took the swab they were reading the instruction and then they were putting back their sample uh, back into the bag that was provided to them. Uh, it was it was proven and it is proven that self-swabbing is 
almost the same as accurate as uh, any kind of swabbing. <laughs> and uh, that's the whole basis. Clients make themselves the swab, so we also limit the possibility to get infected on the testing site. And they just put back their sample. And then uh, we had a specially designed place in the, the, in the resort where the testing actually was happening. And the samples were gathered, gathered, the clients were waiting in their booths until they got the results. And here is the testing place. What is important is that the buffer that we provide with the kit is completely inactivating the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, and this was proven by uh, PHE in UK. So we have a governmentally tested buffer that is inactivating the virus. We also have a platform that was developed together with Yoti that is helping the user that is performing the analysis to go with the testing. So you don't. Sure. So uh, we also developed a testing platform that is helping the user to go with the testing. Therefore, there is no need to write any names of the patients on the tubes and so on. Everything is in the system. Uh, in the cloud, all personal data are being protected and the tester has no idea who is he testing, which is also very convenient. And the test you can see here how, the, how it looks like. It's actually an eight well strip, fully lyophilized, so no need to mix any reagents and a direct test. So you take the patient sample and you put it directly to the testing well. And the results are available within 30 minutes on either Yoti uh, app or given in any kind of solution, uh, depending how the country and regulation wants it. So. The test is designed this way that it can give a binary result together with the testing platform, or it's designed this way that the lab diagnostician can look on the result and say, okay, this is positive or this is negative. Uh, thanks to that, our solution is actually very open. It can be adjusted either for point of care testing. So like on the airports where there is the shortage of the people that have the knowledge how to analyze any kind of um, results, or lab-based solutions. So we can also provide reagents and tests to the fully functional BSL2 plus laboratories where a technician is making the analysis. Sabina, what about this uh, Yoti um, uh, platform for people who don't know yet? What's, what's the connection between you and Yoti? Yeah, so uh, our one of our investors is Mr. Robin Toms, so co-owner and, and founder of Yoti. Yoti is an identity application, fully acknowledged in European Union. And we, together with Yoti, developed a system for going through the testing. So the user that is making the test has a step-by-step -step procedure. And also we created a plugin that after testing, the results can be visible on your Yoti, which can be very handful, for example, when you're traveling uh, and you just don't walk around with the paper written, I have no COVID, but you can just show screen of your cell phone of your Yoti acknowledged app saying that you have no COVID and you were tested like, I don't know, 12 hours and, ago. Yeah. Or even and this is acknowledged by the relative authorities that what that are involved in the this data exchange kind of uh, system or anybody yeah. can acknowledge it. In what, what jurisdictions is in what jurisdictions is Yoti now like active and valid, so to say? Uh, so far, Yoti is acknowledged in UK and they are fighting to and struggling and may, aiming to get acknowledged all over acro across Europe. But I see. it depends only on the usage, because uh, if we want to think about uh, air freight, uh, you would obviously talk with Amadeus and here uh, also the discussions are open. It's just about uh, acknowledging how you present the result, because at the end of the day, some countries want to have it that the diagnostician or the doctor, how it is in Czech Republic, oversees the result. And this is the only problem because Yoti as an application that is having your identity is fully accredited. It has all the certification and cybersecurity that is designed as it is now in the world. So, so that's fine. But when it comes to presenting of the results, it's a matter of country to country. Um, for clients, when they just want to show uh, to anybody that I am not tested positive, this is a very handful solution. When it comes to traveling, it depends how 
each country on the exit and on the entry wants to have it. Some countries accept electronic passports, vaccine passports, testing passports. Some still prefer to have it on a piece of paper where the diagnostician or a doctor is issuing a result. Okay, so just to make sure, uh, the results of the test are uh, ready within 25-30 minutes, I understand? Yes. 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 So imagine privately I run, uh, let's say, a resort, okay, somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so it's, I am legally and so on, there's no restriction for me to buy um, a standalone mass testing machine, as you say. And then for my own needs, I can test or ask people to take tests, basically. Mm -hmm. And within half, yep. half an hour or so, I know whether or not I can accept a person or not. We always make clinical trials for all of our solutions, obviously to prove the effectiveness of our solutions to our clients. And all of our diagnostic tests have at least 95% uh, specificity when it comes, uh, sorry, sensitivity, when it comes to the reference method. They are 100% specific, 95% at least sensitive in detecting of SARS-CoV-2. And Frank underwent at least 15 different validations because all of our distributors, before they make a big order, they make their own internal validation. Uh, so we were tested in Uganda, in UK, in Czech Republic. Uh, when it comes to SAFED, uh, we are now after testing in Norway, uh, which, is, uh, which has ended today actually with a big success. Uh, so, yes, all of our tests have to be clinically uh, proven against the reference method, which here is the RT-PCR. So any technology that is being used in, in every typical COVID laboratory. The difference between our solutions and the, the ones that you can see in any kind of COVID lab is that our tests are, first of all, freeze-dried uh, and one step. So you do not have any procedure of mixing anything in the middle. You just have a test that it's a strip, it's freeze dried. There's nothing more to be added. Uh, it's a direct method. So there is no need to somehow purify the sample from the patient, how it is normally in a COVID lab, where you also see the technicians that have this old PPAs, they are specifically dressed. Here, there is no mendeling with the sample. And also that the buffer that we provide to our solutions are always tested that they are inactivating the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Yeah. So these are the main advantages, yeah? And above all, then there is this 30 minute of testing, which actually at the end of the day just depends on the machine that you're using. Because our tests actually uh, can run in 14 minutes. The problem is that each of the machine th that is being used, uh, they are known as thermocyclers, have their moments of heating and cooling. And machine to machine, it's different. So sometimes the test can take 25 minutes, sometimes it, it can take 35. It depends on the machine that you're using. We are an open platform. So we say to our clients, you can use this machine or this machine, or this machine is also fine, but we know that this machine can be used up pretty easily after half a year. So you should keep that in mind. We are a little bit different than when you look on solutions like Abbott, where you have everything in one. So you have machine tests and everything and it's a closed system. Uh, here, the client is pretty much educated by us, how to use the test and what machines to use it with. So as far as the machines it, uh, themselves, you are not, going to produce them uh, at scale? No. Okay. no, we are not a manufacturer of the machines. We are clear producing... Clear biotech, right, okay. Clear biotech. Of course, we have this one beautiful romance that we have. It's the mass testing machine that we are trying to finish up by the end of March. It's going to be a machine that is going to massively test samples. And it's a prototype. Uh, it's going to have the possibility to test at least uh, 9,000 samples per 24, 48 hours, depends on the complexity of the machine that's uh, inside. The main idea okay. is to show that the patients or the clients actually before, for example, they are launching on a depart can leave their uh, sample and you do not need to have seven or five thermocyclers. You just have can have one big machine that looks like an ATM and it's full robotic. So it's doing everything unscrewing the sample, dosing the sample, running the reaction. So a full automated lab in a big uh, ATM. 
And this is it's something still an R and D. Do you have an MVP on uh, of this mass testing machine yet? Yeah, it's it's a we are working on a prototype, and we should release the or present the the working prototype at the end of March, and it should have at least uh, processiveness of ninety six samples per thirty minutes, so like a regular thermocycler, but it's gonna be it's gonna be fully automatic, and the idea is to present that when you compare mass testing machine and our uh, typical thermocycler that you can find in the lab, mass testing machine is gonna be faster. <laughs> yeah, and it's not gonna have the need of a technician. Whereas in front of the thermocycler, you will have a technician that is gonna do the pipetting and MTM is gonna do this on its own. You, you will just see 96 people putting their samples into the ATM. Which would be in the public uh, in, the, in, the, in the public areas or in a specialized laboratory? Uh, <clears throat> well, or do you foresee yeah, this to be generally yeah, used by the general public, like outside? Well, the idea first is to put the mass testing machines to the airports. And of course, the beautiful solution would be also to do it in the lab. So we can imagine places like big COVID mass testing laboratories where, for example, Austria is uh, testing their uh, citizens very often. So for Austria that is testing each of a citizen at least once per week, twice per week, providing an MTM to each laboratory can speed up their processes pretty significantly. So yeah, both uh, of the implementations are possible. Yeah, be, uh, on the business side, Sabine, if you can maybe disclose a couple of um... Uh, details about how much are the test kits and um, how much have how many have you sold already or do you have like long-term contracts so this is like one-off kind of deals um, that will be interesting as well well uh, as i mentioned we are basing on our distributors network so we have at least 20 distributors in our network that are buying tests on a weekly basis uh, the price of the test, of course, it depends uh, on the quantity that is being bought uh, and to the end user that is going to be delivered. Uh, so far, uh, one of our main distributors that is actually active in Great Britain, the one that was uh, representing our solutions to Virgin and the British Got Talent, uh, so far those contracts uh, gave a pretty, pretty big revenue. Uh, for GeneMe, uh, which allowed us actually to develop different tests and reinvest those money to generate new solutions like the two gene testing, uh, so safe test, and others that we want to develop in the first, uh, in the second quarter of this year. So the tests that are targeting three different pathogens, so COVID, influenza, and respiratory sensitive virus. Uh, so the revenue, uh, of course, we would wish ourselves to have it a little bit bigger, but it's also always related to the production capabilities that we have, right? Because uh, we are still in a startup phase, so we are in the process of ramping our production. And currently our production here in Poland and Gdańsk gets around half a million tests uh, per month. And okay. from, so from the tests that we are produce, producing, we are selling all of them. Yeah, and the whole production is in Poland, in Gdańsk, right? Area. Yes, the whole production currently is uh, in Gdańsk, Poland. We have a cooperation with a company in the United States that is uh, doing one of the refinement processes for us. And this company will allow us to unlock the scaling to at least two, three million tests per month. And we are in the process of in developing actually this process to have it as quality and as desirable as we want it. But in like any kind of business, scaling is always a <laughs> bit of a pickle. Yeah, of course. I mean, come on, this is understandable. You are still in just just after your seed round, I understand, and there's a whole like world in front of you, of course. Um, Sabina, enough for the product solution, I guess. Let's move on to the competitive scape uh, landscape. Um, who are your key competition uh, counterparts, let's say, uh, globally? Mm -hmm. Because I would say this is a solution visible globally and also you would compete for global, um, mm -hmm. on the global scene as well. Well, of course, when it comes to molecular diagnostic, the, the biggest competitors is the big four. So Roche, 
term of Fisher. <laughs> so all the companies that we are pretty, pretty aware of. The ones that are active in UK, so Optigen uh, as well. All of the companies are pretty, pretty well known for us, for us. And we have a business relationship with some of them, actually. Uh, we would not like to see us as a Genie company, the company that actually developed its production in the last eight months of the pandemia, to see ourselves as, as a company that would like to fight against those big companies. Because um, there is enough market share for us to provide to the solutions to all of the people that are in need especially that each of the companies has a different branch and different area. We have the tests that are one step and freeze dried. So those solutions can be used, for example, at the airports and the laboratories that are making this testing for flying. And I believe that each of the big companies um, and us can, let's say, share the cake uh, and have the opportunity there as it is. Yeah, so let 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 the big dogs sleep until you grow into <laughs> a bigger player. I understand your approach. Okay, of course, of yeah. course. With this diplomatic answer about competition, uh, let's move on to the next round. Um, in the whole history of the company, by now, what major things would you have done differently, knowing what you know now? Oh, that's a very beautiful question. And I could say almost everything <laughs> uh, and nothing at the same time. Obviously, people that are running their startups and probably will listen or find this uh, podcast sometime soon will pr probably know what I'm saying right now. Because in the phase when you're developing, you love the speed. And you want the speed because the speed and the pace is giving you actually this gear and grit to move forward. But on the other hand, the speed is also the thing that is causing a lot of major issues and problems and missteps and overseeings that can pile up at the end of the day. And of course, we don't want to uh, look on what is bad. So maybe soon we will write a book about what not to do when you're scaling up a business. <laughs> But of course, there, there are lots of things. There are lots of things, especially they are connected with the very fast tempo. Uh, and I would say that the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, mistakes that we did as, uh, as, as the startup is that we did not focus enough on some details because we thought they are not important. But like what? you learn like what? that they be are- Be specific. Be scientific specific <laughs> about your own <laughs> mistakes. Come on, they're in the past and you're now at a completely different level right now. Yeah, I, I would go with, uh, with scaling uh, specifically. So uh, we as a scientist tend to ignore the effect of scale. So it's like when you make a big, uh, when you are used to making a chicken soup in a two liter uh, pot, you know how to do it. It's pretty simple. But when you are supposed to do it in, I don't know, 2,000 liters, you assume there is no difference. You just multiply. Uh, but actually, it's not because there are lots of things around it. So, okay, the pot is bigger. The heat, heating needs to be bigger. And there are lots of things that you cannot foresee until you make those mistakes. Yeah. So I'll help you be more specific. I'll help you be more specific. Do you mean a uh, problem with scaling on the production or in distribution sales and, and, and business development as such? What specifically uh, do you have in mind? Well, it, it's both. It's both right. in production. So specifically when you are ramping the production, uh, there are these problems that you cannot, you do not focus enough on small details when it comes to making stuff, making the solutions, running the whole production line, times, etc and it also comes to the business development so yeah. you at first are in this run that i need to acquire as much as i can of the distributors and then you are like okay but i have no production to give to you <laughs> uh, yeah but, sabina so today how would you do this things... yeah yeah how would you do this differently let's say not the production but let's say the business development what would you do differently you would you would hire more salespeople, or you would be more aggressive with uh, what signing the contract with as many uh, distributors as possible and then sift the bad ones and, and and stay with the good ones? What would you do differently today? I would focus very much on the clients that distributors have. 
So I would not uh, sign as many distributing contracts as I can. I would first take my time and analyze and talk with the distributor to whom he wants to develop uh, and provide the product. Because sometimes there are these distributors that are coming and saying, yes, give me a lot, give me a lot. Then you give them a lot. And then at the end of the day, the distributor is not delivering or he is delivering, but we as a manufacturer are ending uh, with the problems connected with implementation. <clears throat> now so you're I talking. Now, this is very specific now. So not to rely on your distributors too much and basically do the due diligence behind their presentations and Zoom meetings yeah. with your direct uh, partners and see who are their partners, right? Yeah, sometimes the distributors are very eager to sell and it's fine because that's their job. Uh, but very often, not very often, sometimes they do not have the idea to whom to sell. Yeah, and they buy and they sell and then the clients, the end clients are ended up with, I don't know what am I supposed to do with this product? I bought it, but I don't know what am I supposed to do with this? Or the distributor is yeah. saying, I'm going to buy a lot. I'm going to buy a lot and he's not buying a lot. Yeah, and we waste the time and energy on teaching and schooling. Uh, so, yeah, uh, when it comes to business development, I would make, as you said, a bigger due diligence on some of the distributors. I would look into their history, how long they are on the market, um, with whom they are actually collaborating and maybe me making at least one or two meetings on the Zoom with the end client together. To, to, present, yeah. Together, yeah. Yeah? to present that, okay, yeah. so this is, this is me, I'm the distributor, this is my client ABC. Yeah. So we need this and that and to make some more cooperation in, in this way. So I take, it, I take it this way. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I just want just one comment. I take it this way. Any distributor has kind of um, two types of businesses. There's a purchasing and there's a selling. Right. And yeah. so on the purchasing side, they are selling to you some I promise that they will take as many as possible and they will sell everything. So this is one way of doing business for them. And this is what this is what you relied on. Right. But you didn't yeah. check whether or not they can not only buy from you but also sell to end users and this is where this there was a problem interesting yeah and not in all of them but this is something that sure, can sure. happen then then they sell and sometimes they do not know they do not sell it correctly as well and at the end of the day we as a manufacturer get a lot of inbound but i was told differently and we tell okay but read the instruction, read the disclaimer, it's clearly stating that it is and that, yeah. Um, there is also a lot of things connected with landing of each of the client that is on the side of the distributor. Sometimes the distributor in his goodwill is promising a lot of things. And then he's coming to us and said, but I promised it. And we say, but we cannot deliver this to you because this is what we are not promising. <laughs> so uh but it's th those are the things that you can very easily mitigate because you make another meeting you talk and but it's costing yeah. time and you do not know if you would maybe use this time at the beginning maybe it would not happen so you could use this energy to some other areas right great lecture De great great lesson really this is what I, I was trying to get from you so from your diplomatic kind of introduction thanks let's move on to round four the company so you mentioned already the company fo was founded in 2018 I understand. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. So you are a team of uh, co-founders, uh, three of you, David Nidzworski, yeah. uh, CEO, right? Mm -hmm. Sabina Zhowendowska, CQO, I understand. Yeah. And uh, Kasian Shemiako, CTO. Um, yeah. Somewhere else, the division of the labor is clear. Who was the grandfather or mother, let's say, of the business? Who was the first to think of the, uh, of the business? So the person that first thought about the business was David, uh, because he got inspired by 23andMe. Uh, some of the people maybe know, if not, I would recommend to look up their webpage. 23andMe is an American-based company that developed the diagnostic of the whole genome for the people connected with genetic predispositions and ancestry. Yeah. Um, so David was inspired by it, but thought that this is a too big solution to deliver to the people especially when it comes to the GDPR, because people are giving their whole DNA to 23andMe. And literally. we thought... L literally, that. Literally, literally. Yeah, and we thought we can have something similar here in Poland, but we do not want all your data. We will just test your specific genes that you want us to test, and that's all. 
Um, and the whole idea was around giving the people the possibility to test themselves in a lifestyle matter. Uh, because for most people, genetic testing is connected, was connected before COVID with cancer, diseases, so bad things, people that would not like to know at first sight. So we tried to approach it from a different angle. And um, the idea was to give a solution for lifestyle preferences. So dancing, music, mathematics, food intolerances, very things that are very mild and people would like to know. For example, if my child has the possibility to have dyslexia or if my child is going to be the next Einstein because it's amazing in mathematics. So that was the idea. Uh, and and uh, the main, let's say, fiction viewer was, was David. Cassian is the person that delivered the high tech. So Cassian is our brain when it comes to enzymes, reactions, PCRs. He's the mastermind. Yeah. <clears throat> and then I came along, the person that gave the quality, the regulatory, the compliance, the approvals. And we were about to start. But then, as again, I told you, COVID came. And we were like, okay, so nobody is gonna buy genetic predispositions because everybody will be interested in knowing if they have COVID or not. So we switched our business angle to this. Now, Jimmy has uh, around 230 people working in two departments. Uh, wow. It is service, yeah, it is service labs. There are all across Poland. We have service laboratory in Gdańsk, Warsaw, uh, Katowice, and Poznan. And it's a whole production department that is based here um, in Gdansk. And we are making services still, both for Ministry of Health and for the end users. And we are also producing dairy agents for ourselves and for other labs and for our distributors. And uh, it could not happen at all without the people that we had to hire in the last eight months. And from the biggest challenges, I would say that this was the biggest challenge to start from a three people company and then maybe six people company to a company that is now 100, at least 120 people uh, to acquire those specialists uh, in a very short time was one of the biggest challenges uh, for us as a company and as a startup. Yeah. Are you hiring right now? Do you still need people for like key positions? And if yes, what positions? We are, we are currently looking for sales manager for abroad. Uh, we had today actually uh, two recruitation talks uh, for now. Uh, we are still looking for a production manager, a person that is having a very big expertise in biotech production with the GMP, GLP style. Uh, and of course, uh, for the service department of our GME, we are always looking for diagnosticians, so people that are making the analysis in the labs. So, so yeah, whoever so would like to be interested, mm -hmm. <laughs> send the of CV. Course. Yeah, if you have uh, those the roles in the sales, you said uh, for um, um, foreign sales based in Poland. Uh, based in Poland, uh, okay. yeah, because now I mean. We would prefer to have first the contact with the person, but if somebody uh, is not living in Poland and has a very good experience, I would not have a problem to hire anybody from uh, from abroad if he has a good experience and good flow. Because at the end of the day, this is what it matters. The people that have a special connection and a vision and share this a little bit crazy spark that we have as uh, Genie founders. And what foreign uh, markets do you focus on? only only abroad actually so european union uh the states are now out of the reach because we need to pass fda and we are current in the currently in the process of acquiring fda emergency use approval uh, that would be uk and that would be all middle east uh, united arab emirates and so on uh look let's make a side side point here about fda test so i understand you are now get, uh, being certified by food and drug uh, agency right how difficult is the process do you have a local representative or an agent or lobbyist or any officer locally that helps you or are there any organizations that you just sign the contracts and they do all the job for you how does it look uh, 
So uh, if I would recommend something uh, to anybody who is based in Poland and is interested in getting FDA approval, for sure, get a company from United States. <laughs> because um, we uh, made for now three submissions. Uh, the first one we got finally after around six months, first questions, and we made this all by ourselves. So we didn't hire anybody. It was me literally filling out the form and delivering all the documentation. Second one we did together with Yoti, and we are still in the process of getting feedback. And the third one that we will uh, we will submit, uh, and we are in the process of writing right now, probably was going to be with the Cornwall University of the United States, because FDA takes a lot of time to process anything that is not from uh, USA, and FDA is strictly focused on point of care solutions, so something that can be used as a one. So. Uh, Lateral flow test, of course, very easy uh, because they are just lateral flow test. You spike something and the result is there. Uh, any kind of molecular testing, of course, preferably like Abbott solution. So machine plus test. And for us, it's also machine plus test because we recommend the specific types of machines. But because we are from Poland, it just takes a lot of time. And so you basically so outs you outsource that. It doesn't mean that you have to register in the states and so on. Your partner, local partner, just knows how to go through these like hoops and 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 barriers, right? Yeah, I would say yeah. If anybody would be interested, I would say to acquire a good company that can just basically push it forward uh, a little bit yeah. in the queue. And you buy you buy a service, right, from them. It's it's what they do on on a fee, basically, right? We had several contacts from those companies. We did not use it yet, uh, but I presume, yes, they work on a fee, like any kind of consulting company. Yeah, okay, clear. Sabina, let's move on to final round, uh, Formula F3, and uh, we call this uh, funding funding for the future, okay? Mm -hmm. So um, you just closed the seed round, um, correct me if I'm um, wrong, 5.2 million euros. Yeah. And uh, the lead investor was Robin Toms, the CEO of Yoti. I understand. Yeah. Um, so tell me, how do you plan to spend this money? And uh, if you uh, know already about the next investment round, when and um, and uh, how you plan to um, uh, execute it? So all the money, uh, as you can imagine, uh, as a startup, was completely invested into the infrastructure. <laughs> So acquiring the production line and finishing up the production line and acquiring components to produce the product, because that's the only thing that matters right now. Yeah. Um, for now, Genemi uh, is generating uh, its own revenue, both from sales of the reagents and, and from the service angle. Uh, we are looking up now for new investors. Uh, hopefully connected with the investment into the mass testing solution that we want to uh, present at the end of March. Uh, for now, we are basing our operations from the revenue that we generate exactly from selling of the tests to our distributors and from uh, selling our services in Poland and also in Czech Republic. Do I understand correctly? As far as production, you are completely independent. Yes, we are completely independent. That was actually the whole idea. First, we started our service department uh, as a company that has specialists in, in molecular diagnostics. And somehow to mitigate the shortage of the reagents, we saw that it's just more feasible to produce them on our own. So we started to produce them. And then uh, some interest parties came and said, okay, so you make it so good. So why not sell it and produce it a bit more? And that whole story started with Jinmi making its own production department of the tests that we are selling currently. Interesting. So you have some hardware in the pipeline, I understand, mass testing machine. You have independent yeah. production line in Poland alone. And who knows, maybe you will duplicate this in some other markets, right, as well. Um, you have servicing business line and you're selling test kits now like most actively and for COVID, but also for other lifestyle related as you say testing 
which is a clever decision not to do a wholesale kind of genetic test, but do you know pieces of the of the complete yeah. Yeah. genetic test. That was interesting. Sabina, do you yourself or your the founding team have an, a picture and a, or plan strategy about the exit for the company sometime down mm-hmm. the road? Uh, yeah, of course, there, there are plans for, for some kind of exit strategy. It just depends on the offer and the valuation that Jinmi will, will hit. Uh, for now, we are focusing on building this valuation by ramping the production. If we reach our desired valuation, of course, there is a option for exit strategy. But for now, we are very happy where we are right now. Uh, we want to build uh, further uh, as it is going right now. Because uh, at the end of the day, for us, Jimmy founders, that is actually the whole game, uh, the building, uh, the structuring. This is something that is actually our drive. We are not much uh, players for valuing and selling and exiting so fast we want to play a bit ah, as every scientist <laughs> ah interesting interesting i mean you can all, always exit yeah equity wise you can always exit equity wise but remain professionally in the company right? exactly exactly and this is one of the solutions that we also uh, look into it just depends uh, how fast we will reach our desired valuation Uh, Sabina, thanks a lot. That was a great chat and uh, we wish you all the best and uh, to reach the desired valuation as soon as possible. And that's a shout out for all the investors interested in this space as well. There is an opportunity here for a, a, an acquisition, basically. So join, help grow the valuation and uh, who knows, maybe uh, acquire the whole company as well. Thank yeah. you, Sabina. All the best. No problem. Nice talk. So Jin Mi, everyone, and I'm pretty excited about their value proposition, which is basically enabling everybody in the world to be sometime in the future able to make a genetic selfie tests at home. And not only for health issues, but also for genetic predispositions like talents, sports abilities, learning problems, and so on. Wish them all the best, and we'll be following their successes on our ITK Media website as well. That's it for now, but there's more to come. Bye-bye.